trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the last episode of the season of the Soak by Slash podcast. My name is William von der Palen, here at the Helsinki office and having Isak Rauti with me in Copenhagen. Hi, Isak. Hi, William. Nice to meet you again. Nice to meet meet you, yeah. <laughs> meet <laughs> yeah, you again. See you again, that many times before. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've said that a few times, actually. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> This is the first time I called you out on it. Um, hey, we are going to end the season with a bang. Uh, we have the huge honor to be hosting two of North Zone's partners. We have uh, Wendy Shao Shadek and PJ Patterson. Welcome, both of you. Hey, everyone. Hi there. Great to be here. Super great to have you. Uh, as is usually uh, the way it goes in, in the Circle by Slush podcast, we usually give the floor to our guests immediately. So do you want to give a short introduction of yourselves and, and uh, you know, what you've done, how how long you've been at North Zone and etc. Ladies first. <laughs> sure. Um, so I'll start from the very beginning. Uh, I was originally born in China. I moved to the U.S. when I was about seven, immigrated with my family to Michigan, where I grew up, kind of the good old uh, Midwest U.S. upbringing, uh, and then moved to New York uh, about 11 years ago and you know worked in management consulting here for some of the largest industries that we're actually disrupting right now. And it was very evident Um That at the time, a lot of them were just unable to cope with what was happening uh, in in kind of uh, both organizationally, but also coping kind of against the new tech and uh, the new tech entrants that were completely just eating their lunch. And so, I decided to give up on helping the old guard and join kind of the new guard and started a company um, in the co-working and childcare space uh, here in New York to help kind of enable young. Uh, and new mothers to keep continuing to work in the in the workforce and kind of uh you know take an entrepreneurial dive while still caring for their uh, newborns and then at that time i was also getting my mba at columbia and i met pj um, and i decided to join north zone uh, at around 2015 and i've been here ever since great uh and uh wendy is Uh, uh, really spearheading our uh, Web 3.0 um, practice, and um, and, and that is uh, that that also shows how fast this industry is moving. I started uh, when this industry was super small back in in the late 90s, um, and uh, uh, the uh, the entire venture capital industry has gone through tremendous changes, and particularly in Europe, but also in New York, I would say, uh, over that time period. And uh, from being a very marginal um, asset class, where which very few people really cared about, uh, to now being at the center of, uh, I would say, a secular shift, Uh, where uh, where basically entrepreneurs are changing how we uh, how we live and how we work and 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 everything, and uh, seeing that from you know from up close and being part of that transition has been a tremendous uh, experience for me, and uh, I've been fortunate to work with some of the greatest entrepreneurs coming out of Europe, but also out of New York, um, such as Donny Liek of Spotify, who I saw, uh, served on the board of directors for 10 years. And um, uh, Jonas and Philip, who built Avito into one of the biggest uh, online classifieds platforms in the world. They actually, last time I spoke to them, they said that uh, about 5% of the Russian GDP is actually traded on that uh, platform, which is pretty astounding. Uh, and now in, in more recent uh, uh, years, we, um, Wendy and I co-led an investment into Spring Health, which is a very exciting um, healthcare company. So, uh, you know, I'm, I've been a long time in this industry, but I've never seen such, such exciting times as now. Yeah, it's uh, definitely sounds like an exciting journey and, and something we picked up also uh, 
well, along our own entrepreneurial journeys, albeit very short so far, but still, and also from doing this podcast, is is the very same thing that the world seems to be full of of opportunities and there's kind of this validation going on for entrepreneurs and venture capital and it truly is a very great time to be doing things like this and it's it's a good thing as well because there are some really huge problems to be tackled in the coming decades so i'm happy we have good entrepreneurs and a lot of capital doing that and not only maybe heads of states and mm. the eu and, mm. and uh, stuff like that uh but we Indeed. we agreed to to talk a little bit uh, about the european ecosystem what's going on but also talk about the coming years uh, web 3.0 crypto uh, interesting new technologies but uh, maybe we could start off with with talking about uh, the first six months uh of of this year uh, and in terms of capital invested in europe it's been quite a record breaking uh, period of time so in your view what's happening in in europe at the moment Yeah, maybe I should uh, start then. Although that we are, um, you know, Wendy is US based and I'm uh, Stockholm based. We we do look at the world not so much on geography, but more on sectors. Uh, but you know, taking uh, nevertheless the geographical standpoint, I would say that uh, Europe has, um, as many other territories over the past uh, year, experiences uh, enormous fast-forwarding of uh, uh, digital behavior um, that is not only driven by the fact that people can't go to the workplace or that they have to log on to pl- platforms like this, but it's also that it has created a sort of second order of change uh, where um, processes, uh, business processes, decision-making processes, and Um, and, and a lot of uh, ways that you work are being questioned uh, in, a, in, in a way that we haven't really seen before. And, and most of the time, the, the big enemy of, of uh, startups is, is the status quo that you don't want to change. But there has been so much change fueled by, by this um, uh, COVID pandemic that Uh, has really played into the hands of startups and uh, and scale ups. So uh, it's it's been a tremendous amount of capital that's flown into the market. But what I think is even more impressive is that when you actually look at the performance of these companies that are getting these kinds of you know substantive uh, financing rounds, their performance is you know breathtaking. Uh, they have growth rates that are uh, you know far and beyond uh, what we've ever experienced before. So so even you know, a venture, venture investor thinks that uh, 150 to 200% growth uh, in a year is phenomenal. That is more like the rule uh, in many of these uh, exciting startups uh, in, in this past year. Yeah, and I'm just interested. kind of- Sorry, Wendy. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, No, please, Wendy. Um, no, no, I was just going to say, to add on to that, in terms of behavior change, we obviously see kind of Europe leading a lot of that in terms of e-commerce penetration. Um, and it just, you know, and, and you know, other, other types of digital behaviors. And it just doesn't make sense that capital availability doesn't follow. And so I think what's also become quite realistic uh, in, in the past six months is that, that global venture capital Uh, is starting to pay so much more attention to Europe than ever before. And, you know, part of it, I, I, I like to think it's, it's just a part of human bias being kind of outside of your in-person meeting mindset. You get to reflect a little bit and think about the opportunities globally uh, that you can access now virtually, both for VCs and, and entrepreneurs. Um, and so you see a lot of, you know, a lot of our U.S. colleagues. Um, again, I'm, I'm here based in New York, so I see a lot of my colleagues in New York just like incredibly excited about the European opportunities uh, and, and as well as kind of on the West Coast. I'd like to take a step back and ask about Web 3.0. Like you said, PJ, that uh, entrepreneurs are shaping the word world these days in, in ways that we haven't seen before. I mean, the shift can in many ways be seen as paradigmatic even. I mean, if we talk about Web 3.0, then I mean, I, I guess it's better if I let you give a short introduction, but at least the way I understand it, like it, it, when when 
me when the meetings or the the, the moments when people meet uh, move, are moved increasingly to the internet, the friction between those meetings uh, and the political frictions, whatever kind of frictions you want to apply to those, they uh, they are diminished, and and the role of protocols um, become much more important compared to institutions. This is the text that I read from you, Wendy, um, re- taking it directly from there. But could you actually just give a short introduction? What is this paradigm shift? What is Web 3.0, and how how uh, what are the implications of it? So I think you know the the idea of Web 3.0 is still fairly abstract, and a, a lot of different things can be attributed to it. But I think the very simple way of maybe internalizing the overall idea is uh, the idea that you know it, it's for us in tech uh, and and us in venture. Um, you know, it's always about coordinating more human activity through technology. Uh, and, and a lot of that has been online. Um, and so if we look at traditional ways of doing that, it could be through human organizations. Um, but I would you know, propose that what Web3 is starting to do is doing some of that coordination in kind of a digital marketplace type of format using code. And that is what protocols are. Essentially, it's you know, marketplaces without intermediaries uh, that are automatically executed through code. And so that, you know, for example, uh, could be a Bitcoin mining network where people hook up hardware um, to the internet and run code and they help together secure a financial system using encryption um, and, and, and power. And then it could also be kind of, you know, Ethereum, which is a, a global more kind of executing uh, computer, so to speak, where, you know, again, people kind of plug in their machines and can help kind of run uh, financial smart contracts in a, in a decentralized and, and democratized way. Uh, but then if we also look at kind of, you know, the idea of Web 3.0 and what we've been investing in kind of in this phase of technology adoption, and I don't think we're fully there yet to what I've just described as sort of the ideal uh, idealistic vision of, of having kind of everything run in a decentralized coordinated way via code. Uh, I think what we're seeing is starting to, you know, companies and port- protocols are starting to build bits and pieces of functionality that can be added to existing businesses, um, whether it be through the uh, API or other types of kind of components. Um, and then these components together can be adopted by kind of existing sort of uh, financial services companies now, or health tech companies, or consumer companies. I think DeFi is a, a great movement, uh, you know, example of that. And we can talk more about what that is for for folks who aren't familiar later. But also NFTs is another great example of, of one of these components, where it's really about managing digital media online in kind of a seamless and decentralized way. And and that as a component is very powerful when you apply to something like online football trading cards, for example. But, you know, uh, companies that, you know, that that operate like that, I guess they could consider themselves a part of the Web3 movement and then they could could not. But I think the definition in itself can be a little bit you know, limiting in that way because it is such an abstract idea. And if, if I just add on to that, because I think um, and we've been discussing that at great lengths, uh, Wendy and I that there was a, a really a big shift between Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. And, and if you think of it, all the big companies that are, are currently like the, the real uh, you know, trillion dollar companies, they were largely built on the premise of Web 2.0 when the internet went from a, a relatively static, uh, almost like a sh- uh, you know, shopping window um, setting to something that's very dynamic and could actually start to organize business processes. So, so the the level of abstraction increased and the functionalities uh, uh, multiplied, going through that in the early parts of 2000 and led the uh, laid the, the f- uh, framework and the, the groundwork for some phenomenally big and successful companies and and most of the startups that we invest in today have that uh, in a framework at, at, at its core. I think what's so exciting from a, both, a, I think, societal and, and an investment standpoint is now that Web 3.0 represents another leap in that sort of uh, abstraction. Uh, how that looks like in the future, it's sort of hard to tell. 
it's um, uh, if you com- most of the if you compare most of the 3.0 companies right now with with the Web 2.0 companies, they they are not you know super competitive if you compare them like for like, but they have a different sort of growth trajectory ahead of them, and that's what's exciting for us as investors. Yeah, I think this is it's I'm very glad that we get to bring this topic up also on the mm-hmm. Slush podcast in Slush Slush uh is also all about looking for the next big things and uh mm-hmm. this is something that it's it's interesting when talking about for instance Bitcoin how the media narrative is is quite narrow at the moment and it's what you see in mainstream media is that oh, it's too volatile to be a currency and and this and that and and you know it's used for illegal activity and that and it's kind of a nordic lens it's kind of a european lens it's kind of a, like a privileged lens also to look at this technology through because if you you know obviously in in very well off countries you have a relatively low amount of corruption and relatively high trust in in institutions but in many parts of the world this technology can be a very it can be a leapfrog technology also also in terms of of you know um creating a new economy empowering people and empowering trust as well so it, it seems like this is being This is being shrugged off somewhat, at least in the mainstream media in in Europe, and it's it's very uh, it's very nice to be talking about this. And how do you see you know the role of of for instance Bitcoin here? I don't want to get stuck on Bitcoin, but if you look at the premise of Bitcoin and the wi- original white paper of Bitcoin, it's it's pretty clear, at least to me, that it's one of the it's a very uh, unique idea in that sense that it's the enabler of all the layers that have come after that it's the enabler of ethereum it's the enabler of nfts it's the enabler of DeFi. Uh, that is kind of the original idea that got everything started and everything that's built after that is kind of a micro micro trade uh, and and bitcoin is the macro trade uh, i don't know if you if you catch on to that but that's kind of uh, how mm-hmm. how i see it at least at the moment Yeah, maybe I, I take a, a stab at that. I think Bitcoin was really important in demonstrating uh, a lot of, again, the primitives uh, and the potential of, of this technology across a very important use case. I think it's arguable still if it's you know truly a financial kind of uh, payment rail. I, I think you know most have settled that it isn't, but it could be a proof of uh, a storage of value. Uh, rail or, or something you know a, a treasury type of use case, but. Um, and I think, you know, that in itself is a huge opportunity. Uh, I think we're still in the part of the market where a lot of these things uh, are still very, uh, they, they still rhyme uh, from a consumer's perspective. And so there's a lot of correlation in, in how people think about Bitcoin and Ethereum and all of these others. Um, and, and certainly from an investment perspective for a retail investor, maybe they consider Bitcoin the, the most de-risk from that perspective. But For us, it, it's actually quite different. We look at them very, very differently as technologies, um, you know, because the use case is is sort of what we're focused on, and the utility value of each of these protocols based on that use case is what we're studying. So, a lot of what we're looking at is creating new internet infrastructures, and some might disagree with me on this, but we don't see a lot of that happening on Bitcoin rails. We're seeing most of it happening in other kind of what they call layer one blockchains like Ethereum and, and others. And so we're spending a lot of time understanding, you know, more importantly, kind of what the developers are building, um, you know, useful business or user apps on. Um, and, and you know, we don't let kind of the infrastructure lead us in terms of investing. We let the developers and the consumers lead us when we think about innovation. And that just might mean a lot of these protocols that we're looking at are probably going to be a little bit further removed from consumer kind of mainstream mindset because, you know, it's still like very much uh, uh, an early stage venture backed project. Uh, but, you know, I, I, you know, I think that's sort of at least how, how we think about kind of investing into this space and how we look at sort of some of the currencies versus others. Uh, it's always been a lot less about the token and a lot more about what's being built on top of it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And one, one, one good example, I think, uh, the contrasting to uh, the Bitcoin uh, story, which uh, obviously has much more appeal uh, as a story in itself, but uh, uh, Wendy led the investment in LivePeer, which is an infrastructure to basically produce video capacity. And it's a distributed uh, system, and 
the participants in that network is like a peer-to-peer -peer network, you could say, and they're being compensated uh, with with the tokens. And and the consequence of this and the way it's set up uh, on on the blockchain is that they can uh, produce uh, video ingestion and vid uh, basically a video streams at a you know a small fraction of the cost of what the incumbents can today. And and we think that that's how this will evolve that um, you will have uh, just as you have and if you look into the uh, the ride sharing services like you now have uh, you know hundreds of thousands of uh, independent uh, entrepreneurs uh, driving uber cars or lyft cars or whatever it is there will be hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs being a part of creating infrastructure for various things like being it for video or for for transaction uh, verifications or or, or 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 things like that and i that i think is a new class of of, of companies that are yet to be formed that can be a tremendous opportunity and that and for us as investors uh, we obviously need to look at where will the value be captured there. Is it uh, with a uh, you know with the drivers or is it with uh, the the uh, uh, algorithm or you know what is it? And and that's a very exciting challenge. I'm interested in this uh, in this dichotomy between institutions and protocols mm -hmm. and the shift. Do you do you think? Uh, I mean, I, I think William made a, made a great point, uh, and there's a lot of I, I agree with there. Uh, but but this question still kind of stands. Like, what is this new world going to be like that is supervised by protocols and not by institutions? I mean, it might not be that sort of clear cut of a dichotomy, but but still, that is the dynamic. And so, how do you see how do you see the future being uh, in in contrast with the kind of the old world? Like, what are some of the challenges that these uh, decentralized protocols have to have in mind? Uh, maybe some of the goods or even some of the necessary evils that exist in this like. Uh, kind of stable uh, institutional world that we live in these days? Yeah. It's always fun to try to predict what the future will look like. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, you know, not our job in, in venture capital, and that's certainly not the, the approach we try to take at Nordstrom, but we do have some great kind of theoretical debates about, you know, where this line gets drawn in the future. Uh, I know PJ and I have certainly had those in the past. And you know, what I think perhaps is most important is, is kind of looking at where these activities converge now on kind of these fine, uh, already protocol primitives and company primitives forming on top of them and where the value is being added. Uh, and more specifically, what I mean by that is, you know, when is code better to coordinate people and when, when are people better to coordinate people? I think there's always going to be uh, an element of human uh, humanness that just can never be abstracted away by technology. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there's also certain activities that can just be faster, more efficient, done directly kind of via code from computer to computer. And I'll give an example of, of a company we invested in called Grow Labs. It's, uh, you know, founded by a, a actually really talented Swedish entrepreneur. Um, and what he's looking to build is sort of, you know, the human layer, the, the neo banking layer for the average consumer to build trust in this new financial system. But then the part that can be coordinated by code is sort of all the DeFi components underneath. So he's utilizing the various yield kind of seeking protocols and interest generating protocols, stablecoin protocols to build a financial product that looks familiar to a, a regular human today that deals with neobanks uh, and all of the activity underneath between kind of lending and borrowing and interest rate determination that's being done by protocol and there's a bunch of traders and you know people that are much kind of more focused on that uh, coordinating those marketplaces uh, you know court uh, sort of using those marketplaces facilitated by code but what the company grow is going to build is sort of the human layer of that you know, helping kind of the average person understand what is the 7% yield on a stable coin? Should I trust it? What are the risks underlying it? How do I get insurance for it? 
um, how do I even access this via product? Like, I think product building is a very human function that probably won't totally be disrupted by code. Um, and, and so I think that's a, a good example of where we're starting to see the emergence of organizations adding value versus protocols adding value. And I expect if you extra extrapolate that further, it'll follow the same kind of principles of, of you know, code being more efficiently coordinating activity versus humans. I think, yeah, I think you were onto something important there on, on regulation. And if you think of it, uh, what has uh, happened with Bitcoin over the past uh, three to six months or so, you know, there's uh, one person who holds more power than I think anyone would have anticipated a year ago, and that's Elon Musk. And if this would have been a, <laughs> Uh, like a regulated uh, uh, entity who would have been in jail long ago uh, for you know pumping and dumping and, Many times. and you know yeah and 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 that's that sort of goes to show that when you start when you build an asset uh, category of this uh, this size and there is a lot of consumers running onto the scene and 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 be, being lured into you know, making really big and risky decisions because there are some famous people around. That's that's when the regulator needs to step in, actually. And and I think that it's hard. It's really complicated. And I don't think that there are many people in Congress, for instance, in the U.S. and neither in the U European Union who actually understands this market. So, so uh, I you know we 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 anticipate that there will be some you know substantive issues going forward in this, especially if you're sort of close to the, you know, to the money market like uh, Bitcoin is and, and the fact that it actually presents a threat to the, the fiat system. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, vested interest that, that uh, goes against that, uh, that infrastructure and, and that fuels the, the storytelling even more. Uh, becomes yeah. even more interesting to engage. There will be hellfire raining mm -hmm. down. So to all yeah. Bitcoin holders, you know, prepare mm -hmm. for volatile years and and yeah, do what mm -hmm. you see see fit. But uh, I think mm -hmm. it's a it's a great point that you raised, Wendy, about uh, you know why should we trust only algorithms? And it's it's very easy to have this black and white discussion that's going to be either institutions or or then you have all the algorithms doing everything and and. Usually in these discussions, the, the conclusion is is that it's going to be a hybrid model where some part of the transaction is done quicker, faster, cheaper, and more reliably by an algorithm. But then you still want to, at the end of the day, have have a face to the company and have a face to the algorithm and, and trust someone, at least in, in many yeah. countries. Not necessarily everywhere, <laughs> but in, in many places. That's certainly true. Yeah, um, and that's not just true in crypto, right? We're seeing those trends in, in tech more broadly. And I think here it's it's very much kind of observing an overall movement of the web uh, around these different tech components um and and you know basically providing more tools for entrepreneurs to build better more robust companies at much less risk than ever before and i think this all just ties back to kind of what we were talking about with the paradigm shift of tech in general and, and crypto is just one kind of very far end of that uh, but we're certainly seeing it in enterprise software uh, with more kind of DIY, no code, low code tools. We're seeing it in, in SMB software, um, you know, with a lot of developer adopted, bottoms up adopted consumerization uh, of, of the enterprise type of uh, software. Um, and so this we see kind of as just a part of that broader trend. Yeah, let's talk more about m more about that. So we actually had had a question about that are we in a you know general uh, development trend you can date it back as far as maybe web 2.0 as you mentioned pj and then you kind of have yeah. massive internet ad adoption that gets fueled by the smartphone around 2008 2009 and then you know that propels propels uh, a new network effect suddenly you have you know glo global growing gdp in many many countries more internet users coming in and suddenly you have a massive market so with the changes happening now such as crypto or 5g uh, new companies being founded is it is it just a continuum of the same trends are we kind of just fortifying and, and developing these you know uh, structures that we created in in the internet uh, these kind of platforms or or this is this a bigger, some talk about the fourth industrial revolution with AI and machine learning, Ooh. but is it just, you know, how do you view it? View it? Is it a big paradigm shift or is, is it a continuum of what's already happening? Well, <clears throat> well, I, I think it's, um, it's more profound. Um, it has more profound 
impact than in the past because I think we started at the sort of at the surface with you know the as I referred to earlier the shop window and then we sort of moved cl- closer and closer to the core and more and more industries are being being sort of changed to beyond recognition and some of them have already gone through that uh, you know I would say that you know. Uh, if you look at uh, the music industry, uh, which I you know I had a front seat at that uh, transition, uh, that is continuing to change, and and where the powers are being sort of moving out into the two uh, endpoints of that continuum, where where you have you know, the consumers getting more value for it, and also the artists are getting closer to the money, and the middlemen are sort of dis- uh, disappearing out of the. Uh, of the equation uh, gradually, so and and I think this is moving more and more into more and more industries, and 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 probably the lowest hanging fruit is the financial industry, which I think someone said that it represents some ten to fifteen percent of the global uh, global GDP, and if you if you think of it, the only thing that the financial market is designed for is to be oil in the machinery. It's it has no other value than being oil in the machinery and it shouldn't be actually consumed it should should be should be actually used to uh for other purposes but it's it's eating up 15 percent of the economy and it should probably only eat up like two three percent of the economy so there's a tremendous uh, uh creative destruction that i think we have uh, ahead of us there and i think they they will be driven by by for instance ai and and uh 5G and, and the technologies. And, and I think something that um, Wendy mentioned also that the no code, low code um, uh, transition that's also happening is if you think of it, there are some 25 million code like uh, developers in the world. Uh, and they are serving uh, a market that is exploding in size. But if you sh- change the way you access uh, you know, building of products, and and instead you have to build each legal piece from the scratch and bottom up. But instead, you get you handed a box of Legos. Then everyone can be a developer all of a sudden. Um, and then you don't have twenty five; you have two hundred fifty yeah. million developers. That is awesomely exciting. Yeah, and just to add on to that, you know, I think some have said the word finance shouldn't even exist. Like, what does it mean? Right. To like mm-hmm. emp- empowering you to do stuff with money. Well, what is money? Well, it gives you power to do other stuff. Right. But, you know, to PJ's point, we're seeing, you know, e-commerce talk about a sector that's been forever changed now that, you know, that we've been completely digitized. Uh, we're seeing e-commerce companies, uh, become financial companies using these no code or low code or API based tools. Uh, whereas before they, you know, merchants had to work directly with the bank and then work with their portal to kind of talk to their customers. Now the two can come kind of in one package. Uh, and so you're starting to see the erosion of this idea of finance from, you know, different service providers around kind of the, the business because people can use these financial tools as components. They can build with finance Legos, uh, like Plaid, uh, mm-hmm. like Stripe, um, like, you know, one that we're looking to invest in right now uh, that is, you know, looking to become the Neo Bank for, you know, s and uh, e-commerce merchants. Mm-hmm. And, and, and TrueLayer, which is one of our companies. Yes. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, and, and, yes. and yeah, sorry, just to, just to finish that, I don't think it's it's like, uh, you know, a, a, a lucky coincidence that, you know, North Zone alone out of our, our portfolio of 63 right now has eight new uh, unicorns since, you know, just the last few months and, and, and under a year. Uh, you know, I think that that is, you know, one data point from from our kind of very biased perspective, obviously, that that, you know, things are really changing across all of these sectors. Yeah, exactly. It 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 is a very uh, fascinating time for companies, and let's hope the momentum keeps on. Uh, do you see any other big sectors uh, as as big as as uh, finance and uh, that truly you know needs an overhaul? Uh, are there some other low hanging fruits? Some talk about B two B platform economy being the next big thing, but uh, what else? Well, I, I can I can say that there are, there are, there are a number of, of areas that um, are um, um, 
been impacted as like the the, the first uh, order of change right now for many my, many companies and and businesses is that they're looking at their business processes and how they could be um, uh, be be improved and. Uh, Interestingly enough, um, like if you go to a HR function in a company, uh, they have surprisingly similar requ uh, requirements if you go from one company to another. And for some reason, uh, up until recently, pretty much all the, the platforms, they were made upon the idea that you had to sort of create one uniform ID around your company. Uh, whereas now, uh, I think the B2B software uh, revolution is about that, which processes uh, uh, do we have and how can we optimize them? And then you go out and basically shop for um, a solution that, that can help you really improve that process. And now, for instance, uh, one of our portfolio companies, Personio, is one of those HR platforms that you get on tap, uh, you can be productive from day one, you have pretty much the same need as the next door company of about the same size. And, and it's not only HR, it's pretty much all the core business functions and, and core work streams in across most industries that undergo that change right now. And so it's a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous uh, change in perspective on how you uh, work uh, as a company. And the other uh, area that I would like also to uh, highlight is healthcare. Um, healthcare has the complexity that it's so localized and so localized because everyone has different rules on financing and <coughs> also uh, the treatment ideas have up until very recently been you know, in person, <coughs> converge to, uh, uh, to to practices or to hospitals, and that has driven an enormous amount of of uh, costs into a very specific way to to deliver healthcare, uh, and and obviously the cost for for the healthcare has to go down over time. Uh, and, uh, and now with uh, with the COVID, where we can't even go to the hospital at, at times, uh, the door has been swung open for a digital disruption here. So I see enormous changes in, in the healthcare going forward. Yeah. Uh, just to touch on that, you know, it's one of the few markets we see for for good reasons. Uh, you know, many would agree that the person who's who's paying for the service is not the one receiving for it, uh, receiving the service. And so, as such, the market can be really inefficient in different ways, uh, and create all these pockets of value of misaligned incentives. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're just in our way of like reverse engineering that. We see a lot of great companies reverse engineering that complex incentive system by going directly to the consumer and saying, here's your healthcare options. Uh, you know, Spring Health is, is a great example of that. Here's kind of what's best for you. Uh, let us take care of the payments and sort of all of that administrative part, but um, we'll empower you with a better experience and better data to support improving that experience over time. And, and you know, we think there's a tremendous opportunity there for companies to to kind of grab the consumer's perspective uh, and, and help them understand their data. Uh, but there's also a lot of B2B opportunities there to kind of, uh, in, in, you know, in more abstract ways, uh, you know, connect to the pockets uh, of value and, and, and just democratize sort of the, the data in a way that empowers the consumer, uh, you know. And so... Um, I, I'm not sure if that buzzer means we're out of time or, mm -hmm. no. or is that as that's your phone? Okay. <laughs> I think one, one more area to talk about, which I briefly touched on is, uh, commerce, right? I think the fact that it even has E in front of it as, as now a staple idea is it means it's, it's been permanently changed in ways that we can't, we can't sort of, uh, rewind. Um, if you think about how you make a purchase decision today versus maybe how, how your parents did, you know, 20 years ago, the first impulses are different, right? Um, you don't think to grab your keys to the car and go somewhere, or, you know, you don't think to, to leave your house. Uh, you immediately grab that, you know, black mirror phone and start, you know, clicking on the buttons you're used to clicking. Uh, and for many of us, it's Amazon, uh, unfortunately, or I, I may be fortunately for some, but, you know, I think that consumer journey 
has changed in such dramatic ways that it creates so many new entrants sort of possibilities for for companies to intersect that journey using different ways to compete um in in I think we're seeing a ton of that explosion in kind of e-commerce enablement tools. Certainly, we see a proliferation of e-commerce brands, and, and we've invested in a number of really successful ones in Europe, including Naked. Um, different business models bringing creators of commerce content to you know the the consumer in different ways, and also different ways to engage people as stakeholders around commerce because we used to only buy from brands, and now we. We like live brands. We advocate for them. We design for them. We support. We create. You know, we work for brands, and so we're seeing a lot of kind of commerce enablement tools helping brands and companies deal with this new con- consumer relationship differently in a 360 kind of way, rather than just like a linear path to purchase funnel. Um, and a lot of that money that used to be spent on things like trade, which is just pockets of money, you know, poured into retailers' pockets. Um, we're being, we're seeing it, you know, spent in, in other ways to access the consumer, even maybe give back to the consumer. Um, I think stake, stakeholder ownership of, of brands is, is going to become a thing. Um, and then, you know, we're seeing also a lot of improvements on just how to get the goods to the consumer in kind of a faster, better, cheaper way. Our, our portfolio company, Flink, uh, does quick, you know, quick commerce delivery, and and you know, their their processes are just you know, insane. And, and a lot of what they do couldn't have been built, you know, prior to this behavior change um, that was partially driven by COVID, but also because of, again, of these underlying components of tech that, you know, were primitives just, you know, more recently that they could build on top of. Yes. Lastly, maybe to round off then, um, m- super exciting trends uh, for the world, a great time. To, to be an entrepreneur and also be a consumer, what's Europe's role going to be in all of this? Uh, is it now the era of European companies? Are we are we finally going to be able to compete with with you know the US and China in in many sectors, or are we at the risk of maybe overregulating? Uh, and are we at the risk of a of a very um, you know widespread and and uh, Um, different uh, home market than, for instance, China and, and the U.S. has. Yeah, so, a couple of questions on there. I, th- I think uh, the, uh, the, the 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 fabric of the European uh, economy is so strong, and and now also I think entrepreneurship has become uh, also the one of the most. Um, talked about ch- changes uh, if and if you go to any university um, in the world or in Europe uh, entrepreneurship is uh, basically at the top of the agenda and that was certainly not the case when I went to college in, you know 35 years ago uh, so so it, it's it's uh, a, that's a that's a fundamental shift and I think uh, Europe has really good school traditions and and such so I, so I think that uh, there is a disruption that will Be driven by Europeans and European companies. Uh, what I'm more worried about is also that there are basically three different systems that are emerging right now. One is an autocratic authoritarian uh, system that is, you know, top uh, top driven, and where where basically you know the Chinese system where they can optimize for for their power in the world, and then there is the U.S. system. Which basically is where where the government is um, basically outsourcing policy decisions to companies uh, and, and, and corporates. Whereas, whereas uh, in Europe, we I think we have a much more a stronger consumer protection uh, ethos, and that I think I like as a uh, as a uh, citizen of Europe, and and I really hope that that will be competitive in in an area where you have basically two different forces uh, but i'm 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 not sure quite quite frankly yeah i mm. definitely agree that we hope that that's going to be the winning case because yeah. it sounds like it's the best way for the consumer mm-hmm. uh, to go forward as well i don't i don't even think europe being the underdog is is like a relevant place to start from anymore because mm. you know klarna is a 31 billion dollar company Uh, we also have, you know, Datadog uh, and you know, obviously Spotify and, you know, some of the 
biggest companies started by European founders that people would think are American. And that's just a bias, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, regardless of kind of where the organization is built, I don't think that's, you know, also as relevant as it used to be. And you see that more in kind of these developer facing uh, companies that that have been more distributed kind of as a first mover to start with. Uh, and so, you know, that's, I think another, if you just look at the data, you know, Europe is is more than capable of producing uh, decacorns or multi decacorns. Yeah, I think that's yeah. an excellent point. And uh, it's good that we're speaking up for the European ecosystem as well. And uh, the future looks looks a lot better. And there's been there's been some great stories, and I'm sure there are more to more to come. Uh, we could go all, on all day, I'm, I'm sure, but we need to to let you get on with your days. But it's been it's been a pleasure having you on, Wendy yes, and has. DJ. Thank you so much for for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, this is fun. And uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in. Uh, see you in the fall for some new episodes. And until then, get vaccinated and stay safe. Bye. Bye bye.